recording has started. Um, great, so welcome everyone today. We're going to be talking about how you can boost your Simulink performance. Uh, this has been a bit of a hot topic. Uh, I know a lot of our clients that have been experiencing issues with boost or with slow Simulink performance, and that's what we're going to address today. So before we get into it, let me just introduce the presenters. So firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dershan Mukin. I'm a solutions engineer at Optimum Solutions with a BSc in mechanical engineering from WITS. I also have some uh, prior work experience in the mining industry. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Pranit, to introduce himself. Cool, thanks, Dershan. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, my name is Pranit Kala, as Dershan mentioned. I'm a team lead and technical account manager at Optimum Solutions. Uh, also have my uh, undergrad in mechanical engineering from WITS. I've uh, been around for about five years, supporting customers in the aerospace and defense, wireless comms, aviation and automotive industries, uh, technical and strategic support uh, in this space. Uh, looking forward to today's presentation, Dershan. Thanks. Thank you, Pranit. So to go through the agenda quickly, we're first going to uh, go through the current user experiences and point, pain points that we've um, identified. Then we're going to go through the five different tips that you can use to speed up your simulation, which involves um, changing your simulation modes, your performance advisor, fast restart, parallel simulation, and model references and simulating cache. And along with the five uh, tips, we're going to be at each after each tip, we're going to be doing a simulating performance demonstration to show you how you can do it in Simulink yourself. Okay, so. What challenges are you facing and what challenges are our clients facing in this space? Well, some of the challenges that we've identified is that people keep continually ask, can I speed up my code building process? Uh, my model takes really long to compile. Is there anything that I can do about that? And yes, there is things that you can do about that. Um, can I speed up batch workflows and parameter sweeps if I'm not changing my model? The simple answer is yes, with a simple tool called Fast Restart, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, fourth is, I have a powerful PC, but I'm not using it to its potential. Uh, can I make use of uh, my powerful PC? And the uh, simple answer again is yes, well, especially with a parallel, parallel um, computation toolbox, parallel simulation toolbox, sorry. And lastly, are my uh, simulink settings correct? This is a very uh, simple question, but changing your simulink settings can really improve the performance of your simulink models. And there are tools built into Simulink to help you assess whether your Simulink settings are correct or not. So let's jump into it. How can we, um, how can we pr improve performance? Well, there are three key aspects that we can focus on when it comes to improving performance. The first is to improve model quality. And first and foremost, what we can do is we can always upgrade to the latest version of Simulink and keep our licenses in maintenance. The reason why that improves model quality and model uh, and simulating performance is because with every iteration that MathWorks releases for MATLAB and Simulink, they always improve things such as your solvers um, and your model methods and your, your, your solvers and your model methods, um, which improves the performance of uh, your Simulink model. In addition to that, they also provide a number of different new blocks and functions and toolboxes, which improves the workflow and the quality of your model. And lastly, um, by upgrading to the latest version of Simulink, they also provide new functionalities um, and upgrades, and they also um, fix certain bugs. So for example, they added in uh, the Simulink tool strip, tool strip which um, improves the workflow or decreases the, the, the amount of time you spent in going through settings to change certain things because they um, improve the, uh, the feature capability of that. Secondly, you can uh, improve um, you can improve your model quality with the use of the performance advisor, which essentially looks at your entire model and it gives you suggestions on how you can improve settings to improve your model quality. And lastly, you can look at incremental workflows in Simulink Cache, which we'll uh, discuss later on. The second topic that we can look at, or the second sector, is maximize, maximizing hardware resources, and that can be done through parallel simulation and parallel building. And lastly. How can we leverage code generation to improve uh, simulating performance? And the way that we can do this is with the use of simulation modes. And we're going to start off with that one. So tip one, simulation modes. Simulink provides multiple simulation modes to reduce the compilation and build times. 
I'm not sure how many of you already knew this, but there are a number of simulation modes that Simulink provides. Uh, namely, there's three, normal, accelerator, and rapid accelerator mode. And you can access it from the Simulink tool strip by going to the simulation tab and selecting the drop down where you can find the normal accelerator and rapid accelerator modes. Alternatively, if you are running your, your simulations with the sim function through a MATLAB script, you can actually access it or change the simulation modes through a MATLAB function. And we're actually going to do that today uh, during our demonstrations. Okay, so starting off with the first simulation mode, which is normal mode. Simulink has an execution engine included, including solvers that invoke model methods to update states and the model outputs at every time step. So in layman terms, what does this actually mean? Well, what this means is that when you uh, click run on your Simulink model, what essentially happens is that Simulink will first go through an initialization stage where it will determine the execution order of the block, blocks, and then after that, it will go through a simulation loop where it will calculate the output of every single block at every single time step, and it will iterate through this. This is what most people expect when they think about how Simulink solves a model, and this is how it behaves. But um, it is a very slow and inefficient way of doing things because it e executes ind individual blocks one by one in, 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 in an interactive simulation. So what are the benefits and shortfalls of running in normal mode? Well, the benefits are that you still have the debugger or access to services like the debugger, runtime diagnostics, and algebraic loop checking. But the shortfalls is that normal mode is not optimized for performance, so it provides high flexibility but low speed. Um, to counter this, there's accelerator mode. Now, in, in accelerator mode, it uses just-in-time uh, just in time acceleration technique to generate portions of the model into code, which decreases runtime overhead. So essentially, when you click run on your Simulink model, it will analyze your entire model and find certain blocks and subsystems that it can generate into code that will give a performance increase. And the reason for that is because running certain blocks in code uh, provides a performance increase over running it in the interactive simulation mode. The downfall of running it in accelerator mode is that that initial compilation time is slightly longer than normal mode because now it needs to go ahead and build certain blocks into code. But um, it's not a big concern because once you've compiled it once, it gets stored to memory for use. So when you run your model again for the second, third, and fourth times and so forth, it doesn't have to regenerate that code. It's already stored. So your compilation time actually decreases significantly on uh, successive iterations. So what are the benefits and shortfalls for running in accelerator mode? Well, the benefit is that you still have access to certain services like debugger and algebraic loop checking. But the shortfalls is that it does not support certain services like runtime diagnostics and if and then checking. So a good practice would be to run the model, your model first in normal mode to at least ensure that the, uh, these errors don't occur. And once you're satisfied, you can go into accelerator mode. The second shortfall is that the initial overhead to generate code is higher in accelerator mode or basically the compilation time in accelerator mode is higher than in normal mode. So accelerator mode provides medium flexibility and medium speed. The last mode is rapid accelerator mode. And in this mode, what essentially happens is that uh, Simulink will take your entire model and convert it into a rapid acceler accelerator standalone executable. Now, the fact that it does that means that the initialization time is considerably higher because it has to take the entire model and build it into code. But the performance, um, the performance uh, advantages that you get from this is considerably uh, better, especially for large models. Rapid accelerator mode is specifically for large models and Mo Monte Carlo simulations. And again, like in accelerator mode, once you've compiled the model into a stand standalone executable, you don't have to redo that process. So for your second, third, and fourth uh, simulations onwards, uh, the compilation time decreases significantly. Um, another benefit of running in rapid accelerator mode is that once you have the standalone executable, you can run the executable on a separate core to speed up the simulation further. So what are the benefits and the shortfalls? The benefits are it's optimized performance and it's suited for long and batch simulations like Monte Carlo simulation. 
The shortfalls are that it does not provide any additional services like runtime diagnostics, debugging, and algebraic loop checking. Secondly, um, your entire model needs to be supportive of code generation uh, to be able to create the standalone executable. Therefore, you are limited in the number in the type of blocks that you can use. There are certain blocks that are just not um, supported by code generation, and you can't use that in your model then. And lastly, as I've mentioned, uh, there's a large initial overhead time cost to compile the model for the first time. So rapid accelerator mode provides limited flexibility, but high speed. Let's quickly take a look at uh, the three simulation, uh, simulation modes together in a graphical approach. So as you can see, the normal mode has a very low initialization time, but it's the gradient or slope of um, this line is extremely high. So running this uh, simulation in normal mode means that the simulation, the actual simulation time is going to be extremely long. When compared to accelerator mode, you have a slightly higher initialization time, but that slope is considerably less. So your simulation actually runs a lot faster. And therefore you see a bigger benefit of it. And the thing with accelerator mode is that you can see this benefit even on small models. And that's what we're going to demonstrate to you. Well, Pranit will demonstrate that in the demo coming up. And lastly, rapid accelerator mode. As you can see, rapid accelerator mode has an extremely high initialization time, but it has a really flat slope, meaning that the simulation runs extremely fast. And you can start to see that as the simulation steps increases for your model, so the larger the model gets, um, you start to see the benefits of it over normal and accelerator mode. So something that you might be thinking of right now is, how do I select the appropriate simulation mode? How do I know which one's the correct one for my model? Well, MATLAB provides a number of checklists and decision trees and flowcharts to help you make the decision. And I've linked it below at this link, which you'll get later on when we share the slide deck. I'm going to hand over now to Puneet to give you a demonstration on the different simulation modes. Cool, thanks, Dishan. Can you share my screen quick? Awesome. Uh, can you guys see my screen? I can see it. Cool, awesome. So uh, what I'm going to go through is just a quick example to cover a normal accelerator and rapid accelerator modes. I'm going to be using a built-in example, uh, which is an automatic transmission example. So on my screen, uh, you'll see a standard simulink model. It has its inputs, it has its engine, transmission, and vehicle modeling and automotive, and there's some sort of control logic inside here. And basically what we're going to do is show you the three different um, simulation modes, which is normal, accelerator, and rapid accelerator. You'll see that I've changed the stop time to 3000 just to give you some uh, context and explanation on why it's running uh, for that long. So I just have a quick script. Um, as you would all know, uh, and if you don't, uh, MATLAB and Simulink work hand to hand. So it's always great to use scripting uh, to automate tasks and automate processes. Uh, so in this case here, I'm going to run uh, this short two lines to evaluate the model. So what we have over here is you'll see that there's uh, the metadata is showing the timing info. So the initialization time was 0 0.3 seconds. Execution time was 1.8870. Termination time was 0 0.049, and the total elapsed time was 2.29 seconds. That's running in the normal mode. So let me go ahead and evaluate the accelerator mode. So what happens in this code is I automatically, autonomously change the simulation mode to accelerator, and I run the code. So let's take a look at this uh, comparison here quickly. So you can see that the initialization time for the normal mode was 0 0.35, and the initialization time for accelerator mode took a bit longer, and the execution time decreased by quite a bit. So it went from 1.88 to 1.87. It was one second slower. And the total elapsed time is much slower as well. What I also would like to demonstrate is if we do run accelerator mode again, so I'm just going to run this again, uh, evaluate selection. If we compare these times, you'll see that the times will start decreasing. So as you iterate through the process, the times will start decreasing. You'll see that the initialization time of the previous one was 0 0.4, and now it's gone to 0 0.3. So the time keeps on decreasing. So that's also something to notice. Elapsed time also decreases. 
And lastly, I'm going to go and run rapid accelerator mode. So let's evaluate that. See how that performs. It's going to take some time, so it's going to build a rapid accelerator target. Like Joshin mentioned, there's some code generation that's involved there. Uh, it's going to run outside of the Simulink solver, so it's going to unplug it. And I can see it's running quite quickly. So as Joshin mentioned, uh, the initialization time does take significant longer, which is 15 seconds. If I scroll up and look at the execution time uh, compared to normal mode, 1.8 seconds in the rapid accelerator is actually faster, but the initialization time did take longer. So if I do run this again, uh, we should see some sort of increase in time that has gone to 3.6 seconds. Now also keep in mind that uh, what Joshua mentioned is these are for longer simulations when using it for Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. So if we have lots of simulations or you're running it for, let's say you're simulating a microgrid for an entire year, uh, that's going to take a significant amount of time steps and time to run. So that's a good case where you would use rapid accelerator once your model is built to simulate an entire year's worth of data that's coming in. Cool. Uh, so those are the three modes. And the last one, which will be fast restart, we'll get into a bit later once Dershan touches on that topic. Cool. I'll hand over back to Dershan. Thank you, Pranit. I'm just going to take cool. control of the screen again. Okay, so that moves us on to tip two, the performance advisor. So the first question is probably what is the performance advisor? Well, the performance advisor is a tool that's built into Simulink that uh, performs automatic checks for possible performance and optimization improvements in your model. What it does is, is essentially it, um, it looks at your model and it provides recommendations on how we can change our model configuration settings, our solver selections, and model block types, for example, choosing between Math, MATLAB integrated function blocks versus function blocks. Uh, and the whole aim of the performance advisor is to improve performance. Another advantage of the performance advisor is that it provides quick workflows to easily change model settings and block types. What do I mean by this? Well, when you run the performance advisor, you have a generated report. And in the report, you can there's hyperlinks that will take you directly to the settings that you can change. So you can easily change them without having to try and find the setting. And lastly, you can find the performance advisor in the debug tab in Simulink. So the performance advisor sounds really impressive, but what are some of the disadvantages of it? Well, the one disadvantage is that it does not consider the fidelity of the model. And what I mean by this is that its whole um, the whole purpose is to improve performance. So it will give you recommendations for improving performance, but it will also give you um, information about how does that affect the fidelity of your model, uh, whether you're going out of bounds of the tolerance of your results. But you need to go through and understand and read the report to understand where are these uh, changes going to affect the fidelity of your model. You can't just go ahead and accept everything that the performance advisor um, tells you to do. Um, so what is the workflow in working with the performance advisor? Well, first we prepare our model, then we go ahead and we can open up the performance advisor and we can create a baseline. What that does is it essentially runs your model and it times how long it takes your model to run, and that is the baseline. Next, it, uh, you can go ahead and select the checks that you want to run uh, to try and improve. So if you're not interested in parallel simulation, you can uncheck that and you can that'll improve the performance of the performance advisor. Uh, then you run the performance advisor. It'll give you recommendations on certain settings to change, like the uh, diagnostic settings and so forth. And then um, you can make changes to your model accordingly and then perform a final validation to see what kind of performance um, increase you received. I'm going to hand over again to Praneet now to show us the performance advisor. Cool, thanks, Dushan. Cool, my screen should be it's sharing. Yeah. Cool, awesome. So once again, we're going to look at the same example that we're using before, uh, just so that we keep things flowing. So as Dushan mentioned, we go to the debug tab. Now there's a lot that you can do in the debug tab, um, also to speed up uh, performance, etc. But like Dushan mentioned, we're going to be looking at the performance advisor. So. Starting at this model here, um, I've already pre-run it just so that uh, we can save some time. And as Joshin mentioned, there's always going to be a baseline performance that's done. So when you build your model, 
It does a baseline test to get your normal time and how it performs, and then it advises. So in the simulation uh, drop-down, it has a few checks. In the simulation target, it has a few checks. And as you can see, there's a lot of exclamation marks in my model, uh, basically outlining what can be changed to improve the performance of the model. So let's take a look at uh, identify inefficient lookup table blocks. So over here, it explains to you enabling the begin index search using previous index results. Uh, and it actually has hyperlinks to where the blocks are. So if I go in and click this, it takes it directly to the block that needs to be changed or addressed in the system. So I can go out of that and I can go through many of these exclamation marks uh, or warnings rather. And uh, it, for some of the examples, it also shows you the original value as well as the new value. So what the performance advisor does is it actually implements the new value and it runs the model to show you a difference on what performance upgrade can be done. And what's great about this is if you're not happy with it, you can close this, you can close your model and rerun it, it'll all be fine. If you do want to implement the changes, you can go ahead and do that final validation, accept all the changes and uh, basically rerun it to see what the performance is like. So what's nice about this also, if you look at the original value and new value warning, it, if you click on the hyperlink, it opens up the configuration parameters. Now, I'm sure most of you would agree that sometimes it's not that easy to find um, uh, configuration parameters. So in cases like this, we're looking to increase performance. It's always good to use the performance advisor, open it up, find where the warnings are, click on the hyperlinks and navigate to the configuration parameters, specific tabs and look what needs to be changed and what has been changed. Cool. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You can see that a lot of the ticks are green, so that means this model was built quite well. Uh, some of the options even give you graphs and performance. So this one here specifically is select simulation mode, and it actually gives you input, like we've discussed previously on the different simulation modes, comparing it. Uh, normal accelerator, rapid accelerator, and up-to-date checkup. So, yeah. Um, great powerful tool to use. It does take some time, depending on the size of the model, um, but definitely valuable. Like we said, trade-off is time taken to do the analysis of this. Cool, thanks. All your solution. Thanks, Bernit. Um, just take control of the screen again. Cool, so that was the second tip. The third tip is going to be fast restart. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this little button. Um, it hides on the Simlink tool strip. Don't know if it's meant much to you, but let's go through it. What is the fast restart? Well, the fast restart button allows you to run iterative simulations by only compiling the model once. So essentially, this is a very good tool to use when you're running batch simulations and parameter sweeps, because when you click, uh, when you have this enabled and you click run, it will initialize your model, run your model, and then it'll hold it in that initialized state. So when you click run again, it doesn't have to do any compilation. You can go ahead and you can change certain parameters such as um, your stop time, your inputs into the model and so forth, and then you just rerun it on that model. Um, one thing you need to note is that because it holds it in that initialization stage, there are a lot of settings that you can't change. So for example, you can't go ahead and change the blocks. You can't uh, disconnect a block and so forth. You're holding the model in that compiled state. You can't go ahead and change, if I'm not mistaken, the solvers um, as well. Um, and yeah, so let's take a look at some of the trade-offs that you can. So as I mentioned, you cannot edit the model after it's been compiled. And secondly, it does not support the rapid accelerator simulation mode, but there is a workaround to this. And the workaround is to use the rapid accelerator up to date check capability. And you have to do this using the MATLAB command line or script. And essentially you pass in this, um, this function or when you run the simulation through Mat your MATLAB command line, you pass in this rapid accelerator up to date check um, argument and you pass in, uh, you, you make sure that it's switched off. Okay, so I'll hand over back to Praneet to show us how to use the fast restart. Cool, thanks, Rishan. Awesome. Cool, so Mathieu should be sharing. Once again, we're going to be using the same model. Uh, it's always great to having the baking demo, you know, always have the baked goods ready. So in the first, first argument that I have over here, it's exactly as Justin mentioned, rapid accelerator up to the check off. 
So if I run this line of code, um, that's going to take you through the example and it's going to show you some differences. So you can see it's quite fast as well uh, compared to the previous separate accelerator. It's 14 seconds, whereas this is 2.2 seconds. So with fast restart, it actually kept the initialized state of the model and it ran it much faster than before. Like Tertian mentioned, uh, if I could take you to the model, uh, there's things like solver if it is held in this state. If I could just bring this over here and see. So you can see that the solver settings, um, they should be locked, but because I ran it in the simulation, uh, it's not showing that here. The things that you can change in the model are generally the things like the input and uh, specific states that uh, are going to be changed as inputs, um, as well as some of the output and the viewing and the scopes. So all of those things can be changed in a fast restart state. Otherwise, solver settings and other settings should be locked if I do initialize that. Uh, I should be able to show you that fast restart is at the top here. So if I go into rapid accelerator, fast restart, and run this model, all the specific solver settings and these blocks will be locked. Cool. Firstly, okay. I'm sorry, very yep. just to mention, when you went into rapid accelerator, it grayed out the fast restart because it's not applicable. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to run it through the MATLAB command line. Thanks. Back cool. to you, Thank you. Okay. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. So, going to tip four. Tip four is parallel simulations. First and foremost, what I need to mention is to be able to use a parallel simulation mode, you need to, uh, it's available through the parallel computing toolbox and parallel server. So, what is parallel simulations? Let's say you have a very powerful PC and you want to make use of it. You have, for example, a GPU in it or multi processor cores. Uh, what you can go ahead and do is you can make use of that by running um, batch simulations and par uh, parameter sweeps on the different cores. Um, and essentially, how this works is let's just say you have a model, uh, you convert the model into MATLAB workers, and MATLAB workers are MATLAB computational engines that run in the background without graphical desktop. So it's essentially MATLAB without the GUI. Um, once you've created the MATLAB workers, each MATLAB worker will have a different, uh, will have the same model loaded onto um, each worker, and each worker will just have basically a different input if you're doing a parameter sweep. This, the, this then gets loaded onto the, onto the different cores on your laptop, depending on how many uh, cores you have, and it will run the simulations in parallel uh, on the different cores to speed up the simulations. Okay. Um, when it comes to uh, parallel simulations, you don't just have to run it locally. So you can run it locally or you can run it on a cluster depending on whether you have access to that. So what do I mean by that? If, for example, you're working at the office and the office has uh, a server and with computational powers, you can actually Go using Simulink, you can go and search for that server and you can use um, the processes on that server to run parallel simulation. Alternatively, if you also have access to uh, online services like um, Amazon Web Services or um, Microsoft Azure, you can use uh, you can connect Simulink to those and use them for parallel simulations or additional computation um, performance. So. Uh, parallel simulation also supports fast restart, but you do need to specify it using the MATLAB command line using this, these two arguments. So what are the advantages and the trade-offs for parallel simulation? Well, one of the advantages is that it's suitable for running parameter sweeps and Monte Carlo simulations. So when you have different number, if you're using the exact same model, but you just um, have a number of different types of inputs that you're trying to test for, you can essentially um, run each, well, load all the inputs into different MATLAB workers and then run that par um, in parallel. The trade-offs for this is that it's time intensive to set up. Um, and what, what do we mean by this? Well, in order to set this up, firstly, you need to know some MATLAB scripting because you need to do this through the MATLAB, uh, a MATLAB script or the command window. Secondly, there is overhead to starting the simulation on workers because firstly, it needs to go and search through your laptop to find if there are any workers available or cores available that it can use. Um, and then it needs to set it up. So it needs to clean up the workers. It needs to load the model onto the workers and so forth. Lastly, um, 
so I know that does sound like uh, it's very time intensive, which it can be, but um, the performance advantage that you're going to get from running it in parallel is tremendous. And the last trade off is that you can't run simulations that are interdependent because it loads the model uh, every single well, it loads the model separately on each individual worker and the workers don't talk to each other. So you can't have interdependencies. OK, I'm going to hand over to Puneet to demonstrate this. Cool, oh, thanks, Ashan. While I'm getting my screen ready, uh, I just want to add in terms of the time intensity. Uh, Optinum, like I think uh, a lot of us here at Optinum, we have the skills and knowledge to do this quite quickly. So if you do require support to get that going and set up, um, for us, it's, it's quite uh, natural. Uh, and I think the, what's also beneficial is that once it's set up uh, and once you've done it for the first time, moving forward, it's much simpler and easier because you already have the foundation and baseline set up. So all of the things you need to get a script going, you know, you have the knowledge and it's just easier from there. Cool. So we're going to be using a road suspension example, uh, and I'm just going to take you through uh, the script that we've created. So this is the road suspension interaction of a three degree of freedom uh, vehicle. And just to show you that that's the simulating model. Um, like Dershan said, uh, I've already started my uh, parallel server. So if you look at the bottom left of my screen, uh, I currently have six workers that are available for me to use. So it's gonna actually speed this up quite significantly. So I've already started it up. You can go to the preferences as well and take a look at some of the settings that I have. Um, preferred number of workers are 12. Um, I'm not yet at that level. <laughs> we have 12 CPUs, but uh, six will suffice for this example. Cool. So I'm just going to run through each of the sections that I have in the script to set it up. Um, you'll see that everything is being done in the background. So uh, I'm getting to the timing. So lines 54 to 64, or rather 62 to 64, is going to run my parallel simulation. So what I've done is I've used the TikTok uh, function to show how long it's going to take to run this. Uh, and I've also opted to show progress of the simulations that will run. So it's starting Simulink on parallel workers because I'm using Simulink model and it's going to take you through each of the different models. So like Dershin said, it has to load all of the models onto the different cores that you have available. And from there, it will start simulating. So you'll see that it's going to start showing the progress shortly. Uh, and I believe there's about 20 simulations, if I'm not mistaken. The first six have run, and then okay, 12, uh, 612, here we go, 18, and two more should run. Right, cleaning up parallel workers. Um, cool. Uh, Elapsed time 51.4898 seconds. So, depending on the simulations, uh, and if you have a big cluster setup, like Jershin mentioned, you can actually send this off to a server that is running the parallel computing toolbox uh, and parallel server, which is the large scale version of it. And um, you can comfortably work on your own PC while you batch this off to a server or cluster. And once again, you know, automated features, if I have to run uh, the plotting features, you can actually plot all the results, see what that looks like, uh, save this here, put it in a report and present it. And lastly, I think it's very important is to close off and shut down the parallel server. So it's always important to have that on a script. You don't want to keep the uh, the CPUs waiting. So elapsed time parallel pools, parallel pool using the local profile is shutting down. Cool. And I've closed it off. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much a simple line of code. Pass them, make sure that your simulating model is set up and you have your number of sweeps that you want. So you can see it was quite simple to do if your model is built correctly, uh, which we can also help you with as well as the scripting. Um, that to us. Cool. Thanks, Dushan. Thanks. Sorry, just before you uh, hand over to me, just to put sure. this into perspective uh, sure. of what that 51 seconds means, if you pretty, if you just go to the model quickly, please. Yes. Uh, the sure. alternative to this is to either create a script that's going to, uh, what's it, iterate through the different input um, scenarios, or alternatively, you'd have to come to the model and open that road profiles block on the left. Um, and then change the active scenario, for example, on above that, yep, from mm -hmm. road one, road two, road three, all the way to road 20, and run it each and every time. So 
-hmm. that would take considerably longer. Um, so that 51 seconds is quite impressive. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And now we're going to go into our last uh, tip. So let me get this. There we go. And tip five, model references and Simulink cache. So firstly, what are model references? Well, model references, firstly, you can find they look very similar to subsystems. This is what they look like, except what's different is that in the four corners, they kind of have this little triangle um, over there. So what are model references? Uh, it's basically standalone models that you include into another model. So it's nesting models. And what are the benefits of using model references in your model instead of subsystems? Well, firstly, there's incremental loading because what essentially happens when you have a model reference in your simulation is that it will only load and compile that model block when it is needed. So it decreases the compilation time. Uh, secondly, it supports accelerated simulation, so you can run your reference models in accelerated mode. What does that mean? So essentially, um, you can go and change the, or you can run your model references in accelerator mode so that it can convert certain blocks into code, which will run faster, decreasing the actual simulation time. Um, but you can run your top level model in normal mode, so you still get the capabilities, for example, like debugging and uh, runtime diagnostics and so forth. And lastly, there's in incremental code generation. So what do we mean? What do we mean by this? Well, when you go ahead and you um, have these model references and you generate them into code or these MEX files, um, it will basically just pull this and run these uh, models out without having to rebuild them. So it uh, saves on that build time. Um, and yeah, it only ever regenerates these models. Uh, or regenerates code for these models if these uh, reference models have been changed. So some of the advantages, as I've already mentioned, there's faster compilation times because of incremental loading. There's faster simulations because of the accelerated simulations, and there's faster build times due to incremental code generation. Secondly, we have Simulink Cache. Now in Simulink Cache, well, firstly, it's suitable for large multidisciplinary multidisciplinary models. So if you're working in a big team on a single project and each person is working on a different part of the model and at the end you need to compile it or you need to um, check, like if the mechanical and electrical team are working together, they need to just quickly check if um, their models will work well together. This is where Simulink Cache comes in handy. Essentially, what it does is it takes your models, uh, your SLX files, and it converts them into SLXC or cache files. So it takes your model, it generates it into code, and it compiles it into this SLXC file that you can actually share with your colleagues. And the benefit of that is that they don't have to, uh, it prevents intensive rebuild costs on their side. So this little video shows, um, shows you or demonstrates what happens. So you have the SLX file, you convert it into this SLXC file, um, where it wraps the model along with the um, build artifacts into this SLXC file, and then all the different teams can share it with you so that when you run the model, you don't have to rebuild all those different uh, blocks and models. You just run it and it pulls this SLXC file and it runs the generated code from there. So the advantages is it reduces the first time cost significantly and it can be integrated with a simulating project and pass some. An additional um, feature or best practice uh, that can really speed up the build uh, process is the parallel build feature. So can you speed up the build process for large models? And the short answer is yes, with the parallel build, uh, but it's also very dependent on your model hierarchy. So essentially, when you go ahead and you uh, build your model, just like how you could do parallel simulations, you can do parallel builds. You can build certain parts of your model on different cores and different workers to, uh, to increase the build process. So in this example that we have on the bottom, the original model had, uh, I think it was, they mentioned it was about 400 different reference models, and it took about 57 minutes to build that entire model into, or generate code from that model. Um, when you split that into four different workers, it brought the time down to 20 minutes. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, Praneet, I don't know if you have something to show for this. 
Uh, no, nothing to show here. So, I mean, if you running simulating models and you run the simulation and you're looking to see it, you'll see that there's an SLXC file. Uh, perhaps I can share that. Let me do that quick. Uh, it won't take that long. So it's pretty simple. Um, it's going to be in your working directory. So if you have a look over here on the left-hand screen in the current folder, um, if you look at the file name, it's sldemo underscore suspension underscore three doc slx. And the slxc file is also saved there. So the simulating cache contains derived files for the use with this release and platform, et cetera. And if I can just show, I'm going to try and just run this example here. So if we were to talk about subsystem models, um, reference model, sorry, if you have a subsystem that you bolt and you know you want to reuse each case, et cetera, you can right click on the block, go to subsystem and model reference, convert to, and go to reference model. It's going to open up a model reference conversion advisor. Advisor is always great to go through this year. And I'm going to give it a bash and convert it. It's going to do a few checks. Um, it's in this one year it's failed because I haven't actually modeled it correctly. But what it does is it will create a separate subsystem uh, within your working folder. So if I look at this working folder, I'm going to create, or it would create a separate simulink model, and I would name it body dynamics, so I can change it to something else. And that reference model will be incorporated into this model. You'll see the four triangles at each corner. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah, happy to share more information and share links uh, if you guys have questions after. But, uh, thanks, Jason. Cool. Thanks, Pranit. Well, then that brings us to the end of our seminar. And I guess it's time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Did, did you guys know about this already? Did you not know about any of these tips? Uh, do you think they'll be beneficial? Feel free to type in the chat uh, if you'd like. Um, yeah, this is going to be recorded and shared with those who have registered. So yeah, feel free to reach out to us via email as well if there's any questions. Cool, I don't think there's any questions. So um, thank you very much everyone for your time. I hope this was beneficial to you. Uh, and as Pranit said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Cool, great stuff, Jason, thanks. Cheers, yeah. everyone. Cheers. Bye.